Good morning. Welcome back to the channel. It's great to have you all here. I hope you're being able to stay safe and healthy, especially as we're just crossing, hopefully, the halfway point of this pandemic. I was on a hike with my grandchildren this week, maintaining social distance, and I was talking to my grandson about how what we're going through right now, even though it's very difficult, is of great historical importance. This is a once in a hundred years event, and it's going to shape his culture and outlook on the world, but also our culture as a whole as we go forward from here. It's also great to be back inside and to be warm again. We really are blessed to live at this point in time and in this culture where we can afford to have nice, warm, climate-controlled houses. Last week's video that I shot down along Fountain Creek Nature Preserve really tested my ability to speak clearly in 20 degree weather. And it is cold out. I thought I would come out into this wilderness type area here. And I'm sure that John the Baptist did not have coffee back during his day when he was out there wilderness preaching. Mm. That is so good on a cold day like today. We continue our journey through Advent and this Sunday's readings are taken from Isaiah 61, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and then John chapter 1. This Sunday is traditionally called God at that Sunday, and we're going to get into the reason for that in a moment here. If you're new to this channel, you're watching The Caffeinated Bible. My name is David Paris, and what I hope to do in this channel is to break the four walls of the classroom wide open by taking what I've been teaching in seminaries and making it available through the platform of YouTube. The goal is to help you to engage and read your Bible in a much more stimulating and informed manner. If you like these videos and you find them beneficial and informative, be sure to subscribe. That way you know when I put new material up, especially if you hit the notifications bell. And please be sure to share it with your friends and leave a comment down below. Now, in regards to the readings from Isaiah 61 and 1 Thessalonians 5, what I want to do is just touch on a few small points in those readings here for you to see what's going on. Now, the reading now of Isaiah is taken from verses 1 through 4 and 8 through 11. And I want to look at verses 1 through 4 here. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has appointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the broken heart, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, and to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins, they shall raise up the former devastations, they shall repair the ruined cities, the devastation of many generations. Now, Isaiah, when he wrote this, was addressing the people of Israel during the Babylonian captivity. But yet his message still resonates with us today. With over a quarter million people in the United States dead from coronavirus alone in this year, this is an incredible time of mourning and sorrow and loss for our country. And that's not even taking into account the devastation that this virus is wrecking on people who are having complications and long-term health issues, what they call long COVID, or its impact upon businesses and our economy as a whole. These are very trying times, not just in the U.S., but around the world. And you can see this when Isaiah writes in verses 1 and 2. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted. And then in verse 2, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, to comfort all who mourn. These are incredibly relevant passages to us today. So what is salvation according to Isaiah? Well, it involves healing, liberty, release, and comfort. Salvation is also pictured in terms of two metaphors in this passage. The first is that of a restored city. Remember, Israel has been taken captive by a foreign nation and their cities lay in waste. 
In verse 11, we get a second image, and that is it's as an abundant garden. And this idea of an abundant garden in a very arid climate really speaks about these ideas of blessing, abundance, God's provision, safety, security, and peace. These are the images that Isaiah uses to speak about the year of the Lord's favor or salvation for the people of Israel. This is not something passively that we participate in. In Isaiah's text, it's something that believers actively participate in. Notice how it says in verse 4, they shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities. In other words, the people of God are called upon to participate in the salvation that he is bringing about. God's plan of salvation is like a gravitational, historical black hole at the end of history. It may seem distant and far off, but like a black hole, it is sucking everything into its vortex. We're to be participating in that here and now. We're not going to bring heaven on earth, but we start instantiating that because we are on this journey to that ultimate reality. And this fits with the message of Advent. During the first week, we looked at these great visions from Mark 13 and Isaiah about the ultimate return of Christ at the end of history. Now, as we go through Advent, we transition from the second coming of Christ to his first coming, where we observe and remember his birth in Bethlehem. And during this week, this is one of these transition weeks when we move from the end times or the second coming of Christ to remembering his first coming. Now this brings us to the text of 1 Thessalonians. And just as a side note, it's really interesting to note that 1 Thessalonians is probably the first book in the New Testament that was penned. It's a little geeky, but some of you guys will really enjoy that little tidbit. The first thing to note about 1 Thessalonians is if you read it, you really get the impression that the Apostle Paul is thinking that Jesus is coming again next Sunday. So he has this urgent expectation throughout the letter of 1 Thessalonians that Jesus is coming again. His second coming is around the corner, which as a whole makes this letter really fit with the theme of Advent pretty well. Now this reading from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 begins appropriately with this theme of rejoicing always, and this is why we call this Gaudetet Sunday. In the Latin, the text reads Semper Gaudetet, and this is the verb for rejoice, gaudete. And so Paul writes right here at the very start, he actually wrote in Greek, Latin, a translation just like our English one. He actually wrote to rejoice always. And then in case you miss his point, the next phrase reads, without ceasing. Now in Isaiah, we saw how the day of the Lord is coming. And this is going to bring release, hope, and healing to the people of Israel. The same thing here, Paul is proclaiming that we rejoice always. Why? Because of the salvation that we have in Christ. And if you attend a church that uses more of the old liturgical formulas, especially those from the older missals, the introit or the entry hymn that you would sing as the people process into the church is rejoice in the Lord always. And this is taken from Philippians 4.4. But this passage here in 1 Thessalonians repeats the same idea. And during God at that Sunday, you have the four candles that are at the front of the church. You have three purple ones and one rose-colored one. And the rose-colored one is lit this week, rose being the color that symbolizes hope or joy. Now the second point I want to bring out of this text today is found in verse 23 where Paul writes, Now may the God of peace himself make you completely whole, and may your spirit and soul and body be kept entirely blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, during the first week's video on Advent, where I introduced the themes and the ideas of Advent, I mentioned how Adventus in Latin refers to a coming or arrival. And in the New Testament, it is overwhelmingly used in reference to Christ's second coming. And this is one of these passages here. This in Adventu Domini, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ is referring to his future coming. But we have this term for Advent or Adventus being used right here within this passage. And this is one of the primary reasons why I think this passage is read on this Sunday. Mm. 
I'm going to have to get a refill now before we jump into John 1. If you need to, pause the video and we'll be back in a second here. Ah, the miracle of video, being able to pause it, going off and getting coffee and right back. And it takes place in just the blink of an eye. Amazing. So where were we? Oh yeah, John chapter 1. Now we've got two sections that we're reading out of John chapter 1. And I'll explain why they break it that way. So let's read the first one now. Verses 6 through 8. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light, so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. John chapter 1 is called the prologue to his gospel. It's his introduction, which we looked at last week in Mark chapter 1. In John chapter 1, the first 18 verses, he sets the theological stage for you to understand his entire gospel. So the ideas that are communicated in the first 18 verses of John chapter 1 are incredibly important to unlocking and understanding the message of his entire gospel. We didn't read the first five verses before this. So let me back up and read those now because these are important. And the other thing I'm going to do is when I put them on the screen here, I'm going to lay them out in poetical form. Because John chapter 1, in fact, various points in John's gospel, he is highly poetical in the way he communicates his ideas. Verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was fully God. The Word was with God in the beginning. All things were created by him, and apart from him, not one thing was created that has been created. In him was life, and the life was the light of mankind. And the light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not mastered it. Now notice here in verse 6, which is our reading today, how all of a sudden the poetical layout changes. Verse 6, a man came, sent from God, whose name was John. The shift from sort of a poetical layout to more of a prose form is important here. The other thing is, is that the first five verses really are heavily theological and they cover the concepts of eternity past and the creation of the world and the relationship of this word to the world. Now in verse six, not only do we get a break from poetry to prose, but also we get a shift from sort of eternity past, the vast sweep of history from a theological perspective, to all of a sudden a historically concrete moment. There was a man who was sent by God, and his name was John. In verse 6, when the poetical structure breaks and it goes to more prose, this is when we get this huge shift from theology and eternity past to a historically concrete moment in time. But within chapter 1, this switching back and forth continues on. So verses 1 through 5 concern the word and eternity past. And then in verse 6, we drop into the historical concreteness of John the Baptist appearing on the scene. But it keeps going on. In verses 9 through 18, John is going to drop back into a poetical form where he gives us an overview of Jesus' work and the salvation that he brings to mankind. Then in verse 19 forward, we drop back into John the Baptist. So you kind of go from the Word to John the Baptist to Jesus to John the Baptist. Or we could say you go from poetry to prose to poetry to prose. And this is something that happens throughout John's Gospel. He loves to do these alterations back and forth. In chapter 19, when Jesus is arrested and he goes before the high priest, you have this alteration back and forth between Jesus inside being tried before the Sanhedrin and Peter outside in the courtyard being questioned by the servants out there. And that goes back and forth three times. Then when Jesus is sent off to be questioned or his trial before Pilate, you have Jesus being questioned by Pilate on the inside, and then Pilate will go outside and dialogue with the Jewish leaders. Then he will come back inside and question Jesus, and then go back outside and dialogue with the Jewish leaders. And you get this constant back and forth alternation. The same thing takes place here. This is stylistic of John, and it helps you see this contrast between Jesus, the incarnate word, and John the Baptist, a historically concrete human being. 
Also take a look at the verbs that are applied to John the Baptist. He is sent from God. He came that he might bear witness and he came as a witness. The verb that is used here for witness, martyreo, is really interesting in John's gospel. And I've got my iPad here synced up to my computer, so I'm going to show you just a real quick search. Now, if I parallel the Greek and the English text here, and we search for this Greek word martyreo, which means to witness, you can see something very interesting. Here are all the hits. And up here in the left-hand corner, we can see that there are 33 instances of this verb used in the Gospels. Now, if we pull up an analysis table here so we can actually see where this verb is used, something very interesting comes across. Notice that it is used once in Matthew, once in Luke, but in John, it is used 31 times. This should tell us something very important. That within the Gospel of John, this idea that a believer is someone who bears witness to who Christ is, is incredibly important. John the Baptist's role is to be a signpost. He is to be a witness. His job in life is to go like this. He is pointing at Christ. That is his entire mission, destiny, and purpose in life. For John, the role of a believer is to be a signpost and to point to Christ. John the Baptist does this by saying he is not the prophet, he is not Elijah. His role is to prepare the way for the Lord. He is the one who will point out who Christ is. And it raises the question as you read his gospel that if believers are to be signposts for Christ, how is our life then a signpost for the Messiah? What are we pointing out? What are we pointing to? Is our lives about us, how great we are, how great we can make YouTube videos? Or is our life a signpost and pointing to Christ so when others look at us, they really don't see us, they see the direction that our life is pointing. We could ask this question another way. How is my life a signpost? What am I pointing to? Who am I pointing out? If someone looked at my life and saw where it was pointing, where would it lead them? We now turn to verses 19 through 20. And I was talking about how John oscillates back and forth between the Word and John, Jesus and John as he goes through. Poetry, prose, poetry, prose. What's interesting here is that you can take John the Baptist two sections here, 6 through 8 and then 19 through 28, take them out of the text, and verses 1 through 5 flow very nicely into 9 through 18. You can also do it the opposite way as we're doing here today in the lectionary readings. Take verses 6 through 8, bring it out, and then put it right up against verses 19 through 28. And the two sections flow very, very well together. And this is because of the way John oscillates back and forth in chapter 1. In verse 19, we have John the Baptist ministering and baptizing people down along the Jordan River. And we have a delegation that is sent from Jerusalem from the Sanhedrin to find out who he is, what he's doing, and by what authority he does these things. We could call them sort of the Messiah Patrol. It's important to realize that during Jesus' lifetime, over 30 different people claimed to be the Messiah in ancient Israel. So the Sanhedrin was really tasked to figure out who these people were and if they were legitimate claims to these Old Testament messianic promises. So this is a very important role. They are making sure that the people of God do not get deceived and are led astray by various false teachers. We have three questions basically that they want to know about John. Is he the Messiah? Now John answers that one before they ask questions. He says, I am not the Messiah. Then they ask if he is Elijah and he says no. Then they ask if he is the prophet and to this he says no also. Now Elijah in the book of Malachi is spoken about coming before the great day of the Lord when the Messiah would appear. And then in Deuteronomy, Moses talks about how in the last days God will raise up another prophet that will lead the people of Israel. So these two figures, Elijah and the prophet, really fit with sort of the eschatological or the messianic hopes of the people of Israel. And the Sanhedrin wants to know if John is making any sort of claim or aspiration to fulfill these two prophetic figures. So who is John the Baptist in his opinion? 
He is simply a person who is preparing the way of the Lord. He is making straight the way of the Lord. He is a signpost. And these ideas of making straight and preparing the way I covered in last week's video. And for the sake of time, I'm not going to go into that again. So you can watch that one. And if you haven't, you need to stop this one, go back and watch that one, and then you can come back to this one. John continues, and he says in verse 26, I baptize with water. Among you stands one whom you do not know, the one who is coming after me. I am not worthy to untie the throng of his sandal. What I want to point out here and focus for this week is this phrase where John says, the one coming after me. And Latin, what he says here is, ipsi est postme venturus. Now the venturus there is this venio verb which is used in ad venio, or to arrive or to come. However, it is not arrival at this point in time. This is a future participle. It's talking about the future, the one who is coming, he is not there yet. And this future participle, Venturus here, really, I think, ties in with Advent. John's life was to be a signpost pointing forward to the Messiah, this expected one who is coming. In this sense, he is preaching a message of preparation, repentance and baptism. We are preparing the way for the Lord to come, but it is also a message of hope and joy. There is one coming. And this is the message of Advent. We are preparing our hearts for the one who is coming. And in two weeks, we get to observe that great day during the liturgical or lectionary year. I'm going to leave you there this week until next week when we return with the shift directly to Jesus' incarnation and his birth in Jerusalem in the lectionary readings. Until then, I will close with this incredible message that came out of this passage of joy, hope, and expectation about the one who is coming. Peace.